Hello, parents, and welcome back to another Get Right with Miss Wright. Today, we are going to be talking about the power of digital citizenship, and I'm so excited. We have uh, my lovely co-host, Mr. Dewey Conway, which is our district <laughs> instructional technology coach. Yes, he is amazing. He has been in Conroe for the past 15 years. Yes, he doesn't want me to say it, but he's brilliant. So I cannot wait till he gives you some information. He loves and has a passion for technology. And then also just educating our students here at Bradley, as well as Clark and our teachers, which is so important, giving them the tools that they need to help their students be successful in the classroom. And then we also have another co-host, Miss Pavone, our lovely Bradley parent. She's so awesome. She has a son that attends here at Bradley, as well as her daughter, our previous Bradley alumni um, at Clark. And so I am so honored to have both of them on as we um, just, you know, really relax and really talk about um, just the importance of technology, um, how to have conversations in our home and how we can grow as a family. So let's get into it. So the first thing, Dewey, mm -hmm. tell us, um, is technology bad for our kids? Like, oh, you know, some parents may feel like, like, is technology just really, really just bad for my child? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, and, and I, I just want to start off by saying that I'm a parent as well. Although my, my kids are, they're, they're older. Um, I still had the same questions myself as a parent and it was, is, is technology, or technology tools, something that's uh, is bad. And, and I, do, I do want to just start off by saying that it, it is scary as a parent uh, to, to kind of to open up the world of technology to, to your kids. Um, I, I really would like to kind of make a distinction and say that technology itself isn't bad so much. It's really what, what is done with it and how, how it's treated. Um, first of all, today's talk is about digital citizenship and really we kind of the whole the whole purpose behind digital citizenship and making that such an important part of our technology um, application teaks is that we want to address the question of what what is technology and 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 what can my kids do with it that should be appropriate for them mm -hmm. for, for their age and so really want to make a distinction here that, that technology isn't bad by itself. It's how are we using it? How is it being used to support my student, my students or my child's learning in the classroom? What, what exactly are my kids doing online or even just in an app itself? You know, so the, these are really the questions that are, I think, embedded in that statement of is technology bad for my child? Really, it's more of a question of what what are we doing with with the technology, and why could it potentially be bad for my child? And so, um, does that make sense? Yeah, um, no, so I love how you worded that. And I was going to ask also, Nicole. I mean, like when I think about it, I think there's just so much in the media, right? That's just going on to where sometimes we get really fearful and we're like, no, no technology, no cell phone, no apps. Um, because there are a lot of negative things to happen and happening. But I also think, and um, Nicole, I want to hear from you, but I, what, what I also, what we need to understand is that um, technology is incorporated and embedded in the way that we live. It's embedded in the way that we yeah. communicate. Like we use so much of it. And so um, I love how, you know, today we can really set aside like not focusing on is it just bad it's all about how we use it right well, because I think if I can chime in um yeah. I think with COVID we were all forced to get used to technology those that we didn't really care for or we um limited our kids so much uh, now we almost have to encourage it a little bit because it's the it's the way we're living now. So I think this is a great way uh, of exposing us parents that are not technology savvy because we have to be honest that our kids are more technology savvy than we are. 
So I think I thank you for putting this on because you know it's embarrassing to have to ask your kid, can you set this up for me? Because we don't know how to do it. So I agree with you that it's not necessarily bad. It's just we have to have an open mind to it and realize there's so many good resources now, but we also have to have a little bit of balance with it. It's my point of view anyway. No, you said it best. Go ahead, Miss Nicole. It's getting juicy now. Well, that leads into the next thing. So tell us, Dewey, I'm so excited. So tell us what is digital citizenship and why is it so important? So parents can understand like, what is that? So um, really with, with technology, I want you to think of technology tools in two ways. And one is the kind of technology that is connected to the internet where you're in an online community and then the kind of technology that's just a standalone software like a game or an app or something that's not necessarily, doesn't need to, the internet to function. And so when we're looking at digital citizenship, we're looking at actually both of those. But a lot of times um, when we're talking about this, really we're looking at it through the lens of the connected world, you know, when you're interacting with other people. And so when we talk to our kids, we, we start by, uh, like when, when I meet with students or I meet with teachers, we, we start by asking those students to think about the word itself, uh, and that is citizenship. What do you remember about that word? We ask them, think, we think, think back, you know, think back to second grade and first grade, if I'm working with an upper grade, and we say, well, what, what does it mean to be a good citizen? Mm -hmm. And typically, uh, it never fails. Every student can answer that question. Wow. It, it means to be helpful. It means to be kind. It means to be part of a community. It means to be someone who is safe and responsible. Uh, you know, if they see trash on the street, they're picking up the trash, they're putting it in the trash can. Uh, our kids know that. And, and it, it's, it's kind of part and parcel of who they are. So when we talk about digital citizenship, we want to just use that same knowledge and say, it's that same thing. It's the same exact concept, but now in a digital world, we're living in, a, in an online community, not in the community with my neighbors and going to Kroger and, and visiting grandma. It's not the real world. It's an mm -hmm. online world. And so we are the same. We, we want to practice being safe, being kind, and being responsible. So those are the three tenets of digital citizenship that we are always talking about in elementary is being, you know, that kind, safe, responsible citizen. And digital citizenship itself is all about that. And so as we, as we talk with kids, it's going to be more of a, a deeper dive into specifics of, you know, like situations and, and, and those, those um, encounters that students might have, or, or those things where we, we're, we're talking about what, okay, in this situation, what is the safe thing to do? What is the kind, when you're interacting with people online or your friends collaboratively in the classroom, what does it mean to be kind? What, what are some words you're using? How are you working together uh, to, to build a, a product and so forth? So, so that's really in a nutshell what digital citizenship is at the elementary. And then we want to build on that as we continue up with our, um, with our, kids and when they go to intermediate, you know, as they encounter more age appropriate um, or age specific, you know, circumstances with being online. Does that, does that answer the, the question? Yes, uh, absolutely. Okay. I think, you know, as I'm listening to you, um, I love how we're starting this off in elementary because I'm always stressing to people, elementary is the foundation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I know there's so many things, you know, happening within our society, but if we can have you know, firm foundations with these kids coming out of elementary with um, superior di digital citizenship. Just imagine the impact of the intermediates and the high school for the next years, right? Mm -hmm. I know that we're starting to, you know, we've been working on it, but every year it gets bigger and better. And so it's really teaching kids to be resilient. It's really teaching kids how to, you know, um, be respectful and be kind that I'm hearing but then also in that digital way, because we know sometimes it's easy, you know, to send a message or if you're allowing mm -hmm. your kid to be on the Xbox. And um, I think one parent had wrote a question today um, regarding that, you know, on the headphones, how 
how to handle like if someone's being mean or being very inappropriate, you know, what do you do in that situation? You know, so I think that, you know, this is, this is powerful and this is awesome that we're starting with them young um, because like uh, Nicole said, you know, they are tech savvy and that's what they use and that's Mm -hmm. what they see, you know, and knowing that just because I'm not live in person doesn't mean that it's okay to say mean things or to see mean things or rude things. It's about um, going back to what you said, do we, what am I going to do with that information? So now that it's there in front of me, you know, what can I do? Absolutely. That's so, awesome. So may I add something? And that is, and you, and you said tech savvy. Um, with, we're, our kids have not known a world that has not been connected to the internet. They, they've grown up in a world that is, they, they don't know, like when I was growing up, you know, when I would go to the park and my mom would, my mom would give me a quarter and say, okay, call me when you're ready, you know, to be picked up. And I would have to find a pay phone, you know, put it, put the quarter. In. Our kids have no idea what that means. They, they don't know. They have no context for, for that type of world that was disconnected from, from, each other at the click of a button or, or the tap of a, of a send or our kids don't know that world. And so we call those guys, the digital natives, they are living in this world of uh, this digital world that it, they're inundated every day with, with technology because and that makes them by instinct tech savvy. But there's a myth about that. And just because they're tech savvy doesn't mean that they're information savvy. It doesn't mean that they know how to process the information. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we come in. That's where us as teachers and as as parents are coming in to really help guide them with that. Because they may know the tools, but they don't really know the tools uh, like how to use them and how to find the information they're looking for and how to discern what's right for them and what's not right. So that that's really what digital citizenship is about is, is starting that, that conversation with the kids and starting those expectations of what it means to be online and, and working. Conversation and connection. So Nicole, Absolutely. Like, what, what's your thoughts about that? Cause that was deep. Dude. <laughs> Oh, sorry, Obi, but oh, you know that that's... was good. No, I was like, I was like, Ooh. I have to tell you, uh, one of my challenges as a mom is that um, you really, as much as you try, you really can't have all eyes on at all times. No. So we have to, you know, here we we have a rule. If you know it's not appropriate, if you know mom would not let your dad wouldn't let you watch that. Then the same thing applies for your tablet, for a commercial, for, you know, that's not appropriate. I expect you to change that. So it right. puts a little bit of, you know, citizenship uh, uh, role in that. But reality is, are some of those going to squeeze in when mom's not watching, when dad's not watching? Of course they are. Mm-hmm. So, you know, as a parent, uh, yes, there's so many different tools a lot of times, but it's also very overwhelming um, to be able to know how to, you know, how to limit those or how to, yes, you can do this, but you can't do that. And sometimes you really don't have a choice. If you want, you know, if you want to be able to uh, open up a, a, an iPad because they're, you know, using their reading app for school or they're doing a math assignment and they're playing on the math game and all of a sudden there's this ad, unsolicited ad that pops in that you have mm. no, no control of. That's where the communication comes in with your kid to know, okay, this is the expectation, but it's tough. It's not an easy yeah. way to, you know, to manage that. At it's least my way. I, don't, I haven't figured it out yet. No, and you know what? I don't think that you're the only one. I think like the vulnerability and saying that I think is sometimes, I mean, it can be so overwhelming. So that's why, and I'm pretty sure Dewey's probably going to hit on it in just a minute. Um, when we were talking outside of the show, it's that connection piece and conversation. Mm-hmm. You have to be consistent in speaking with your child and having that just open door of communication 
because they are curious. They are going to see things and they do have to use it. So, you know, instead of like, you better not do this and that's it. And we have that authoritarian, like, if I see this, that's it. You, it's like, is that really helping to build the citizenship doing, you know, um, you know, was just speaking of, are they really understanding the processing behind it? Like, this is bad. Like, I should not be using this because that is not in my right. character. That is not what my parents believe in. And so that's, I feel, what we would want more of than just the consequences itself for doing something that he or she wasn't supposed to do, which, you know, leads me into our next thing. Do we tell us, um, how do teachers, right? Because mama said it all. Mama's like, we can't do everything and parents can't. So how do we tell us about the teachers? Like, so how do teachers help support, you know, these positive interactions with digital citizenship? Well, first of all, I think, I think with teachers, of course, um, we, we talk to our, our teachers and, and our students about what citizenship really means. And that is ultimately it comes down to choice. So if, if I'm out on the street again and I, and I see that piece of paper on, on the ground that's, that's trash, I can make a choice. I can make a choice to pick it up and throw it away, or I can make a choice to keep walking on by. You know? So it's all about choices and, and your grounding and being a good citizen. In the classroom, whenever we, we can make our, and our network is, our, our internal Conroe IC internet is very restrictive. We, we don't let students get on anything that, that are considered games, um, anything that's labeled games. Uh, a lot, sometimes our teachers will say, I'm trying to get them to this website and it's listed as a game, so they can't even access it. So it's, it's, we have a pretty, pretty strict um, uh, network um, firewall. And so there's that. And then there's, we, we can be as restrictive as possible. But ultimately, it comes down to working with your kids so that because something's going to slip through and, and and we want our students to be ready for that. We want them to to understand that whenever I click on something like say, say I'm and YouTube's a big one. So so say because YouTube is open in our district, we, we have to YouTube is as a as an instructional resource is incredible it's it's incredible but it's dangerous in my opinion you've got you've got videos that have suggested videos that aren't or, you know i might be visiting an appropriate video but the suggested videos on the side there might be an inappropriate one in there or one that's not age appropriate right. or the comments below the video may not be you know moderated and they're not uh so it makes me as a as an educator and as a parent it makes me scared you know like oh i don't even want to send them to YouTube. So teachers do things like we'll take YouTube and put it through, like we have Canvas Studio, uh, which will make the YouTube video safe. Mm -hmm. So it removes the ads, it removes the, the suggested videos and the comments. So we do things like that, where we, where we still want to use that resource, but then we want to make it safe for the kids. So it's, it's our due diligence to, to, to kind of guide our students into a safe place. We also whenever we're asking our students to do research, we try to encourage our teachers, don't just tell them to Google it. Oh, I like that. Don't just Google it. You know, we, we want to provide our, our teachers with, uh, a, well, we have what are called safe search engines, like uh, safe search kids. And we use those, which are highly filtered. So they're going to be pulling up age appropriate resources. But then we also refer our teachers to our, and students to go to our uh, online they're called online databases through our single sign-on. So TextQuest, you know, uh, this campus has Pebble Go. You know, Pebble Go is a good resource. I love it. Pebble Go is great. <laughs> yeah, and, and the, thing about, the thing about Pebble Go is that I can send, if I have a second grade student and I need them to be researching in a safe place, me as a teacher, I am feeling confident that, that when that student goes to Pebble Go, they're going to be safe and they're going to find good information, age appropriate information. So it's, it's steps like this that teachers take within the classroom to make that safe envir learning environment whenever the kids are going online. So that's would what, that's what, go ahead. Do that oh, I would, say it again, Nicole. No, 
how do we do that at home? Yeah, I was just about to say, I was like, how, like, so what would be some maybe um, some sites? And I can type them after I can get with Dewey or just off the top of your head, some great sites. Like, say, for instance, Mama, you know, like, I got to do some research on eagles and I don't know anything about eagles. And so, you know, Mama's cooking in the kitchen and she's like, (laughs) that's it. We ask Siri or we Google and we're like, you know, So that's, that's the thing is that we've made our, our resources available at home. All of them are. So, so our singles, the kids just have to sign in with the single sign on and they, and they go to what's called text quest. And, and we, we, most of our teachers have been trained with text quest, but I think a lot of times our kids don't translate that to the home life. You know, they, they don't go, okay, I'm going to go to the SSO and, uh, just like at school and, and click on text quest. So they're just going to Google it, you know, <laughs> uh, which as an adult, I can do that. I, I can and like, say my family calls me and says, I want chicken Parmesan tonight. I, I have no idea how to make chicken Parmesan. So I would, I would open up my phone and Google chicken Parmesan recipes. I can, I can discern what I, what fits me as far as the information goes. I can say, okay, that, that seems like a good recipe. I think I can handle that one. But when a student starts researching, like say they're doing an animal research project and they're doing elephants and they just type elephants into Google, everything comes up, everything does. So it's going to be, it's not only elementary information, but it's going to be research papers. It's going to be uh, wildlife conservation. It's going to be uh, uh, potentially some kind of, you know, age inappropriate things, you know, that come up, you know, because of the hunting that goes on. And so we really need to make sure that we provide those resources for our kids at home. And, and when, when you're saying, when it's like, and I'm in the same boat too, when I was a parent, I was like, help, what do, where do I go? Uh, there are safe search engines out there. And I will get with Ashley for, for making that list for sure. Uh, the safe search engines that are Google search engines, but they're designed for students they're out there and they're really good. Like kids smarts one. And uh, we just, we, there's a, there's a list of them. So I will um, get y'all the list. Don't you worry. (laughs) I was like, Dewey's really good. No, but I'm (laughs) glad that you said that because um, well, number one, for all of our parents, we want you to know that um, Dewey just stated, like they have these resources at home. So maybe you haven't been on the, you know, the, um, the sign on at home. And all of those apps are there that are Conroe, you know, bought and we utilize here yeah. on campus. So that takes some ease off your mind because it's not anything that you have to look into. They just need to sign on and all of their resources are there. Um, for those of you that are tuning in and maybe you, you know, attend a different district, um, I will get that list out for you. But I would also tell you to talk, talk to your technology department, like mm-hmm. what are some you know, safe databases or something that I could use. Um, Because I think that that's really important. Like you said, Nicole, like within whatever I'm researching or whatever I'm trying to get information and kids are curious, right? Because I just Mm. thought about that too, Dewey. Like sometimes they may be bored and they want to know more about being an astronaut or, you know, different states and different cities, you know, but if we provide the platform and the appropriate website for them to go, baby, you can just, you can look up all types of things and read about it. Um, I think that that's a lot safer than um, the go-to, like you said, Nicole, like just Google it. Cause it is, it comes natural. Just put it in your phone (laughs) and something will pop up. All right. So going into next, right? So um, we've learned what digital citizenship is. We know that technology isn't necessarily bad and we know it's all um, in how you use it. I love how Dewey talked about you know, just the, the the connection piece, right, before we correct um, with consequences if my child um, looks at something or uses something inappropriately. So when we are in the school system and the teachers are teaching or you're coming in, um, what are these standards that Texas has, right? Because I know sometimes parents are like, like, how does technology standards fit in the school? Like, what is that as far as um, how my kid is educated. I love that you're asking that. Uh, so the we have the technology application TEKS, uh, and the, that's every every content area has a set of standards that guides it. 
you know, so like say math, fourth grade math, you have a very specific scope and sequence. Like this week we're learning this, and this week we're learning the you know, uh, you know, fractions, and this week we're learning place value. So there, there's always a, a guiding map for us as educators. Well, for technology, we have that as well. With technology, we're not we're not a content standard. We're a process skill standard. So, so what that means is that we want to be an integrated piece into the learning in the classroom. So like, say, for example, I'm, I'm studying social studies and we're studying Texas history, fourth grade Texas history. And we're looking at, um, we're looking at causes of the civil war in Texas. And so a technology integration could be, okay, guys, so today we're going to, I want y'all to tell me everything y'all have learned so far about Texas role in the Civil War. And you're going to be able to do this by choosing a Google slide. You're going to create a Google slide project, or you can go and create an iMovie uh, using our iPads, or you can do an Adobe Spark video or web page. So you're giving them choices for them to process their learning through technology. So uh, that's what our technology application teams address is how do we take what we're learning in the content and process it through a technology tool to create a product, to deepen our understanding, to be innovative about our learning. So these are all, that's what, that's what that's all about, you know, without getting too specific. Digital citizenship is one of these, and we have six of them. So one of the six pieces that we're looking at in our technology integration Digital citizenship covers not only being kind and safe and responsible, but it also covers how we're, we're doing things like recognizing intellectual property. So like, say I'm going to be doing a research project. I find a great picture. It's Mickey Mouse, you know, in, in, a, you know, in a Texas history, you know, or a Texas cowboy hat or something. I want to use that in my project. Well, the conversation then becomes, do, are you able to use that? You know, who is it owned by? It's owned by Disney. Does Disney let you use their images in a personal project? Maybe, I don't know, but we need to ask those questions versus just taking it and going with it. So, so that's, that's where digital citizenship falls also in our, in our learning in the classroom is looking at intellectual properties, uh, making sure that we're safe and not handing out our passwords. And, you know, it's it, so there's, there's, there's layers to it uh, that blend together with all the other six or the other five pieces of our technology applications. Um, so anyhow, I, I hope that answers the question. Yes. Did you know that? Nicole? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I was just thinking we as parents need a digital um, class about that because I never thought, you know, I needed to ask this need to use Mickey Mouse on my invitations for a birthday party it's not things that we think about. Well, just, you know, that kind of train of thought does not come to the regular parent. And, and you know, you're using it. No, it's, it's, it, you don't, don't feel bad about that, but we want, we want our students to know that it's, if it's not yours, it belongs to somebody. And, and did they say, yeah, you can use this. That's fine. Or did they say, make sure and sit, put my name somewhere and cite me, um, you know, so so it's just like, that awareness. I like how you say that too, because even mom, like it may not have to do with, you know, pictures and images, but it could be student work as well. Yes. You know, yes. like, you know, when you're putting out a project and maybe y'all all collaborated fourth graders um, on Google Slides or you're in intermediate school um, and y'all all did a project together and that person, you know, renames it or says, you know, I did all of this. You know, I could totally mm. see like, you know, but did you? Like, you know, did you, or did you contribute to the, the project? You know, I, I love how it's more than I'm learning as well, parents, <laughs> while I'm sitting up here as the counselor, um, <laughs> the processing behind it, like, wow, do it. Like I never, and I'm being honest, like I've been in education for 13 years, not to dig that deep um, into, yes, you know, like we're not just writing essay papers, like there's different ways to process information. And so technology is doing that, but it's doing it with fidelity and making sure that kids are being genuine and true 
you know, with whatever they're putting out or whatever they're learning or with it, uh, whatever they're, you know, accessing. This is, this is amazing. Well, but I will say also, and thank you, but, but I will say that it comes down to repeated practice too. So the teacher, <laughs> teachers really need to con- reinforce it constantly. So, so, and it all just depends on, on what you're doing, but when you're going in and doing a research project, it's always about, okay, if you go to Britannica school, which is one of our resources, or you go to Nat- National Geographic, or you go to any of these resources, make sure that you're copying that link and putting it on a, on a slide in your slideshow at the very end or something that I mean, at, at elementary, well, really third and fourth grade, that's the extent we go. We don't do like APA, you know, citations or anything that, but that's actually in junior high. So, so like, so when your student from Clark moves up to York and they start doing those science projects, science fair, that is all about APA citations. Uh, so um, anyway, it's all, it starts here though. It starts here. I did, I did want to share, um, you mentioned earlier, like um, iMovie, um, you know, all the different technology that our kids are exposed to. Um, during COVID, Sophia started actually making movies. And it, to me, it was just, of course, proud parent as a, you know, wow moment, right? Because you're seeing a 10 year old actually taking the time and, you know, using all the resources and putting a movie together. I mean, I can't put that on my resume, right? And, and at this age, these kids have the capability of doing what a, you know, 40 year old at a job, you know, they're looking for in a resume. So I agree. Going back to, you know, technology is not always bad. How as parents, we actually can encourage those, you know, that the positive side of the technology and the tools that they're learning now through school for a better future for them. Because it's, I mean, recording videos to them, it's like no big deal, you know? Right. As parents, we have to, you know, get in front of a crowd or something and we're sweating over here. They're like, <laughs> no, you know, piece of cake, right? So it's the beauty of it. Um, for sure. We, we also, as parents, have to embrace that. Um, so I think this is, this is great that you guys are putting this on with this information because as parents, um, it really helps to know that there's those resources out there. So thank you for that. And, and I will say that you're, you're hitting a really great point in that you, you never know until you try. Yeah. So, so if you're, if you your student, your child will never know if they're going to be the next great computer programmer, unless they try it. Yeah. And, and if they try it and they're like, well, oh, coding, you know, JavaScript coding, not, eh, this is my thing, then they know. But if they have the opportunity to, to at least attempt it. So iMovie, your daughter, she may be uh, come, coming up in, in when she gets to York, she might be part of their, their film crews there. You know, she might be part of that. If that's something she really likes, she might go into one of those CTE classes there at York and, and where they're doing, where they're doing like theater recording and they're doing these really cool activities, it could all start here. Right. So, so I, I applaud you for, for encouraging that. Thank you. For sure. But and this is something that she learned while we were here doing Zoom yeah. because of COVID. So the resources you guys provide our kids, you know, makes them more comfortable to explore you know technology and i and i think it's great because it is a safe environment and that they're open you know they're used to it so now we just as parents got to get on board with them to be able to safely do that yes and speaking of when you said safely so um we have one more thing before we start to close out so i'm glad that you said safe right because this is all good we're taking on all this information do we we're moving and grooving Uh, We have our resources that our district provides, but here it goes. Tell us some strategies, Lord help us, about some conversations with my child when they discover or do something highly inappropriate, whether it's online or text or some ads and websites. Like what would be, um, you know, your biggest advice on to how to have that conversation 
you know, with our kids, like when that happens, because we do, y'all, you know, they see something, I can't believe that, you know, I don't, we don't do that, look, (laughs) we don't do that in my house, where did you get that from, oh my gosh, I'm taking your phone, what, what is your take on how that conversation should be facilitated? That is a really great question, and I think it comes down to a couple things, and that is, First of all, as a parent myself, it is really scary when when your daughter gets a text from some random stranger, or you're or you're or they're getting into a, a they watch a video that's you know rated R, you know, like the latest horror movie or something. It's just so gut wrenching, you know. And and as a parent, you're like, what do I do? And and that reaction that you want to have which is just give me that. I'm just going to protect you now. So give me that. It's, it's not worth it. You know, and you put it, you put it away. That really, it's like with anything, when, when you, when you, when you restrict, when you make such tight restrictions on things and especially with something that is pervasive, it's a constantly something they're exposed to. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when they leave your house, they're going to school and the kids there are going to have their phones or they're going to have whatever. You know, so when you restrict your, your, your students or your, your child, you just have to be very careful in that it really shouldn't be a restriction so much as a, as a, as a conversation that begins. So it becomes, a, it becomes one of those moments of, because really 99% of the time, your child is not doing something to be bad. It's accidental. Usually something happened or they're just a, something scared them and they're, they're afraid to talk to you about it. Or they come across an ad that, that like is completely, you know, it, it's appropriate in an adult world, but in a child's world, it's completely inappropriate. And they're just afraid. The biggest piece of advice I can give is setting down your child and telling them the reality of things. And that is that this being online is a, it can be a scary place, but you have to know that anytime you encounter anything that makes you feel uncomfortable, you have to tell me you're not going to get in trouble. It's just because I want to be here to protect you. That's my job. My job is to protect you. My job is to raise you and to be that person for you. So don't ever be afraid to tell me. And when that, that door opens up, because what happens is this, I get, I get a lot of questions about what are some, what are some apps that I can buy that are going to help me monitor my child's phone or what, what are some things I can do to restrict access to whatever. And those are all fine and good. You know, you, I had, I had it myself with, with my, my daughter and and son. Um, We, we had something that we paid for just to, kind of monitor and be safe ourselves those are not bad options and you can google all that you know and find find that information but what is bad is not explaining why to your child so if you're putting if you're putting an app on your child's phone to help monitor and be safe yourself and to monitor safety because things happen you know if you don't have that conversation with your child and say, look, I, I, I do trust you. It's not that I want, I'm, we're putting this on because the online world is a big world and we want to be safe and make sure that you're safe. And so that's all this is for. It's not that I don't trust you. It's that I do trust you, but I, it's my job to keep you safe mm-hmm. and, to, and to make that clear to them that you're not just, I'm not, I'm going to be, monitoring you and keeping track of you and all this. And I don't, you know, it, that's where it becomes dangerous is, is if you, if your child feels like you don't trust them, then they're not going to come to you when it, when the big things happen, you know? Uh, so really ultimately that's, that's my biggest piece of advice is really build that trust with your child to say, and just be honest with them and say, anytime you come across something, come show me. We tell our teachers that. We're, 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 with here in, in the classroom, our students, if 
we can't block everything. And if they open that Chromebook and they're doing research and then come across an inappropriate ad, we say to them, please make the choice of closing the Chromebook and letting your teacher know. I tell the kids here, or like whenever I was meeting with third grade uh, this year and, and previous years, I met with third and fourth on, or second to fourth on digital citizenship. Mm -hmm. I would say, if you see me in the hallway and you're not comfortable with something, you come and tell me. You, you know, tell an adult you trust, but don't just, don't hide it or don't be afraid of it. Do you have to trust us? We're, we're here to help you. And so as a t parent, that's really what I suggest. I think you said it so beautifully. Like I couldn't say it any other way. I think it's all about the trust. You know, they are our children. And so even with students, I'm like, you want to leave that door open for communication because mm -hmm. parents, I know you may take things away. You may say you'll never get it back. You can't do this. There is always, we are in a public school system. There is somebody that has some type of gadget, you know, and I would just hate for one of our kids to feel like, well, my like to hide, you know, and just be like, well, my mom doesn't, my parents didn't let me do it. So like, let me look at my friends, right? Mm -hmm. And even when things happen, like you said, Dewey, just you know, and stuff does happen. Sometimes kids get caught up just because their best friend is doing it and somebody's doing something on Snapchat. Um, but even when they see something inappropriate that a friend sees, you know, Nicole, I don't, um, I'm going to give you the floor to say a couple of more words, but, you know, I'm pretty sure you would want your, your kids to come to you and say, mom, like, you know, my friend was showing me this and I felt a little uncomfortable and it's not right. Like, to have that conversation, to know like, mom, like, should I say something or what do I do in that situation? Because the friend's going to show it again, you know, but like do we said at the very beginning, we want to teach them what to say, how to respond, um, and then how to use technology, how to move from whatever that, you know, they are, you know, accessing. And so we want to establish that trust, but go ahead, Nicole. I, um, one of the things that we try to do at home is exactly what Dewey said. It's to build that, you know, trust between mom and dad or, you know, uh, kid, I'm sorry, mom and <coughs> kid and say, you know, even if you know it's something you're not supposed to be doing, I'd rather hear it from you because if you tell me what happened, then I can help you. But if I don't know about it, there's nothing I can help you. Then you come, there's consequences that happen. It's too late. So if you come and tell me up front, we'll have the conversation and I'll be completely honest, you know, age appropriately <laughs> uh, at that time to touch on those to topics. Um, it's scary for a kid to think I'm going to get in trouble if I yeah. speak up. Yeah. And um, one of the things that I've experienced here, because we've had a few of those moments is, you know, controlling myself to not explode and mm -hmm. go, oh my gosh mm -hmm. um, because then you block that communication and when they see your reaction immediately they see I, I know I should have never said anything yep. because yep. I knew you were going to get like this yep. instead yeah. you know as the adult trying to keep cool right not easy but it's doable and be able to get feedback on that conversation and on the facts because even you know I always say, even if you're at fault, it's okay. I just want to know the truth because the truth is what protects you. If, if there's no truth there, you know, there's, there's a, a missing piece, there's a lie in between, then there's going to be consequences that could, you know, potentially hurt you or whoever's involved. So as a parent, my job, like you said, is to protect you. I won't be able to do that if I don't know about it. So, exactly. so far, so good. But, uh, you know, as they get older, it obviously challenge, you know, it can be it, challenging. It, but I think setting those um, boundaries from earlier on is important because they they will come clean or they will at least you'll get some of that information that as a parent, you're able to expand and, and know what's going on with them and maybe what you should have more conversations of um, to keep the kids safe. Awesome. It's, it's not easy. No. It's not easy. And, and that's, but if you have that groundwork established, like you, you, it sounds like you've done, which is creating that, that layer of trust 
when they get older, when they go to junior high, when your students go to, or your children go to high school, it, it does get harder, but ultimately it's again, down to their, their inner mechanics, you know, like what they've been raised with, what, what their, what their citizen, their own internal citizenship meter tells them to do, you know, and, and that's what, and, and it, the kids are going to mess up. They're, they're going to do stuff that, that, uh, you it makes you go oh my god you yeah. you <laughs> you, what you did just I do wrong just uh, you that, come back and be like oh my god just exactly like, you know a deep breath i love like you call like they're gonna show mom you know either i said this or i saw this and you're gonna be like yeah, mm-hmm. just take just, just pause just pause <laughs> just it's really good to just kind of take, take a breath off. You know, uh-huh. Papa Bear wants to kick in, you know, Mama Bear, it, that, all that yes. whole thing wants to kick in. And yes. you're like, oh. if you if you just take a step back and say and say, OK, give me let's we'll talk about this in a few minutes. Give me a second. You know, maybe maybe go have a drink of water or something and come back. And the next part of that discussion, if this if your child is like they know better and you know, they know better and they they don't need that message anymore then the next question is why, what, what made you right. make that choice? What, what drove that choice? And then if they say, well, my friends are doing it. And then you start asking them what, why was that important to you? That mm-hmm. what your, what your friends were doing is something that you felt you needed to do too. When you knew that it was, you've told me this wasn't right. So you knew that, but yet, so to have them start thinking that as you get older, you, they start it becomes more complex that way where, where you have the whole friendships from part, you know, the peer pressure essentially. And just, if you have that foundation work, then it should, you should, as long as you can stay calm (laughs) as a parent. There was was a video, there was a commercial. I don't, I don't remember actually who played it, but there was a commercial about this um, girl texting this boy that had the picture was so cute and handsome and, they were meeting at the park and all of a sudden they show up and it's an older guy and they're throwing this girl in a van. Um, I think, you know, that type of video, it's so realistic. Not necessarily that that happens in a, you know, every, right. you know, for every conversation they have online. But I think, you know, at any point, a video like this, it's totally appropriate to have that conversation with a kid, no matter the age, uh, at least in my point of view. Um, because I think that kind of opens up their idea of, am I being safe when I'm texting back somebody that I don't know? And it, it kind of brings them back to that scenario. Um, yeah. Not that I want to be my, you know, have my kids scared all the time. It's just, I think that it creates some kind of awareness uh, for, wait, am I, is it okay for me to do this? Yeah. So, and, and as you're exposing them to those kind of things as well at home, helps so whenever they outside and they see something like that it's easy for them to recognize and that takes an honesty as as a parent too to be with yourself say am i ready to have this conversation you know because that's that's a that's a tough one uh now i will say as our as our as our students move up in the grade levels we do address things like cyberbullying and we address things like this where we're uh texting and strangers and all of that so it's just in the elementary, we keep it pretty, pretty safe. You know, um, really, we start that in fifth and sixth grade, the cyberbullying message. But um, you know just, what? Just, even but even with the you know cyberbullying, I'm glad that you said that, Mom. It just really depends on where you are and what, mm-hmm. like how your kids have been interacting, you know, with other kids. And I always tell parents, you know, because I was raised very different too, and I knew things early. It just really depends on where they are in their world in their grade level like yeah, i think the prep work before fifth grade could be if you know i'm just giving you an example if you're making that christmas decision on black friday this november to get your baby their first cell phone really think about what are those conversation topics that i can start now because like Dewey said they're gonna get it eventually like in intermediate but maybe like now you're not using mama's phone 
I'm about to give you your own cell phone device. And a lot of parents, that's why I wanted to do this show, you know, right before Thanksgiving break, because I know Black Friday is coming. I know the holiday season is coming. I know people are like iPads, cell phones. <laughs> Look at Duke. Everyone's like technology craze. But when we buy it, we need to like do, we, you know, say we need to be prepared to have some conversations yes, yeah. and start to think about, you don't have to do it all at one time. But maybe, you know, this month, what can we talk about as a family? Like now that you have this device, you know, um, you know, what are some rules are we going to, like Nicole said, as the Pavon family, like what are we going to do in our family when it comes to how we use technology? And I think that those are amazing family conversations to have. Um, and actually, real quick, real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just, just wanted to add to that. One strategy that when you're when you're getting a cell phone for your for your young child, once setting those limits is completely appropriate. In fact, you should. One of the limits, like one of the strategies that that we see, or I've worked with some some teachers on that with their own personal kids, is setting that limit of time. So, in other words, when if it's eight o'clock at night, that cell phone goes over here. So it's over here and it's charging over here. This is the charging station, but that's where it's going to stay until morning. And so they're not taking it into their room. They're not hiding under the pillows online and looking online all night long, reading a Kindle on their Kindle app all night long. You know, it's that's those kind of limits are completely appropriate. And, and that doesn't mean you don't trust them. It's you're setting that limits, that limit for them that that expectation of at eight o'clock it goes over here just like at eight o'clock you're gonna you know or 8 30 you're gonna go take a bath and brush teeth you know it's all part of that same routine so um just wanted to kind of point that out is that with it's okay to get them cell phones but again as she was saying have that conversation and well, and set those limits and it's just it's it's okay I'm glad you said the setting the limits because I was getting to, we had, um, a, I've grouped some of the questions together because they were like the same thing. So we'll go ahead and just really quickly touch base on okay. um, the only thing that we didn't um, talk about. And do we already said, um, someone was like, um, how long should my um, child be on a device? And so mm. I think it goes with the setting the limits. Um, I think it has to be age appropriate looking, you know, mm -hmm. at the age of your kid. And I know that there's like different charts and different graphs that kind of give you advice and recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I didn't know if you wanted to say one more thing, Dewey, but I do think that that's important to set limits, not just give them the device, whether it's an iPad or phone, like have some, you know, boundaries with what that looks like. Cause the, oh, and because of the screen time too, like how long should my kid be on? Four. See, that's the thing is that you're, you're, you do need to set those limitations for time. If you're, and what's interesting is, you know, I'll work with teachers here and um, we, with like kindergarten and first, where they're still developing those mo fine motor skills of writing and so forth. So we don't, we say, don't use the iPads only whenever we're learning our, our, our phonics skills or whatever, we need to have that paper base. We need, because our students are still developing those skills or the, those, those physical skills. It's the same with iPads. If, you're, if your child is glued to an iPad or an iPhone for hours on end, they are missing out on everything else that they need to to be a well-rounded human <laughs> you know as and as a child you know if your child needs to spend just as much time outside they need to spend outside get the hands in the dirt feel the dirt you know pick up a worm it, it, i don't know how you feel about that as a parent but student kids need that they need they need to run and they need to jump and breathe and uh the fresh air and all of these things are very important for them but they can't do it if they're on an ipad all the time. So, so setting that limit of saying, okay, so seven to seven thirty is there you go. So if we're, if we hit the dinner and you did, you put away the dishes, you know, seven to seven thirty is your open iPad time. You can play a game. That's what you can do. So, so you do a, make it part of the routine, but as far as numbers go, children really should not be 
for think of like TV. They shouldn't be watching TV for hours on end. You shouldn't be on an iPad for hours on end. No child I know can sit through a movie without having to get up and move. You, you know, they have they have to get up and move because developmentally they're still develop they're they're still needing that. Uh, they need to be a child. They need to be young. They need to be a child, and the technology is only a part of that. Yes, I, I hope that makes sense. And no, it it's not perfect. okay. Can I chime in on that? Uh, just Absolutely. Real quick. Um, I saw a situation where a parent would not allow technology for their kids, like their Xbox or their, you know, video mm. games. No, none of that, including their iPad, during the week. Mm -hmm. But then they could have it Friday night in the weekend. But these kids come, came in Saturday, they were like glued to that thing. Like yeah. you could not, no. they were not interested in playing. They were not interested no. because they're so um, looking forward to that Saturday that they can get their hands on. I think that it's a better strategy to have a little bit more flexibility, even if it's during the week, but perhaps, you know, an hour or 30 minutes or whatever the age appropriate could be, mm -hmm. but not limit it or not take it away completely because all you do, it's almost like they want it more because of, because they can't mm -hmm. have it. It's the rubber band effect. Yes. You know, you go whoop, boop, and then you when when you you're stretching yeah, and restricting like candy, you know like yeah you need no candy and then all of a sudden they want to they over it like overly indulge over yeah over indulge <laughs> because they can't have it so i think you know a little bit of balance um absolutely safe um you know monitored obviously but i think the you know that whole uh lust that they get from having that technology uh, it's not as intense if they know that they have access to it when they want it and it's not restricted. And I will say, even if they're, if, if you, if they're on, if they're a lot of their one hour and then it's time for them to get off and you're like, okay, guys, we're going to go outside. I want y'all to go outside. And they're like, ah, and they're, they're throwing a fit. Don't give in. No. Don't give in. You say, oh, no, come on, we're going to go. It'll be a lot of fun. And so they're going to grouse. And, and, and But once they're outside, the kid kicks it. it. Yes. They forget about it. So that that's that's where I see also is like they don't, parent, some parents maybe don't want to deal with that that uh, pushback that, that kids will give because they're having fun. They're online they're having, or they're on a game. They're having fun. And then now you're telling them to get off, you know, and, and if they push back a little bit they're like oh, okay fine 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 you know and then the parent goes off and does their thing no don't do that to tell them all right come on no you got to make it more appealing for them say we're gonna go outside i'll come with you i got a ball here we go we're gonna go outside and and get them out and once they're out they're fine so anyway i just wanted to add that no yeah. i'm glad that you did because sometimes that's just the easy to and i get it we're tired right and we're so tired. it's kind of like yeah you know, do your thing, you know, just go outside and play. But I love how you said, you know, even if it, if it's for five minutes and you say, Hey, I'm going to play with you for five minutes, but I got to get back in here, but look, mm -hmm. come on, let's go outside. What you want to do? Let's like, let's do it together. Um, Cause I think that that's the thing with the relationship and the attention piece is that the kids, they want our attention as parents. And I know sometimes we get tired and we love our babies. We really, really do. And we have so much on our plate, so many things that, you know, we're trying to get done, whether it's, you know, wife for duties, laundry, you know, homework, multiple kids. It's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. So when you think about the ease, ugh, get on your iPad you know, like, yeah. and stay over there, you know. Um, but like you said, do it. It's to be mindful too, too much um, of that screen time. We want to get them up and moving. All right. We have one more question. This parent is asking, um, what are your thoughts on how I should handle when my son gets on his Xbox and sometimes I can hear inappropriate language from other kids um, through his headset when he's playing his video games? Well, that's a big one. I know that my husband's a gamer and I have heard some interesting things from kids on the other side. And I'm like, how old is that kid? You know, but think about it, dude. I'm being mm -hmm. honest. And my, my, my husband's like, yeah. And they're like yelling and saying inappropriate things to him. And I'm like, where's that boy's mama? <laughs> you know, yeah, um, yeah. 
So what do you what do you do in that situation? I guess this parent is probably asking, I'm assuming, I hope, um, like, do you keep the speaker on? You know, like, because you don't because you don't want to like intrude on their privacy either because they have their headpiece and that's why they have it. But it, I guess it's mm. just that one time that they may have heard what's really going on on some of these games like Fortnite mm-hmm. and all of these other video games. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, um, that's that's one that's encountered more often than than you think. Uh, the the thing about Xbox Live and, and going online and playing there, or going to Fortnite, or doing Roblox, or any of those, is that you run the you are interacting with people you don't know potentially, or you're interacting with um, with like your friend's older brother or or something. And so so you're not always with your own peer group with that one and so if you have like say say i'm i'm 10 and i'm getting on xbox live and i'm gonna play call of duty which by the way is not appropriate for a 10 year old but you know reality is reality you know and and so like say i'm getting on and i'm playing call of duty i've got my headphones on and on my team is a 17 year old a 22 year old you know a, a 15 year old and they're all we're all we're all doing this together and they're getting mad and they just start in on that talk and i'm a 10 year old trying to process a 22 year old and and so that that's what that's where the real danger is is that i would ask what what if if you hear that going on and this is your child you know they're, they're young and they they're hearing all of this would you let them do that in real life like would you let them interact that way with people in a room with you in real life with that kind of conversation if the answer is yes then let them keep going <laughs> but if the answer is no you you have every right to stop what they're doing and say hey just what's going on just tell me what are they saying it's okay i mean they're gonna get mad that you stopped oh them from playing. Yeah. but that's they're gonna so get- that's so important that you said, sorry, because my but, mind is like blown. Like when I see my husband, like he's playing with his friends, but like you, like you said, because, because forgive me, I'm a counselor. I don't, I don't do the gamer thing or whatever. Um, but he doesn't always use his headset and I can hear the, you know, the people, but like you mm. said, it's, it's such a variety of different people. Yeah. And like, yeah. when I hear like the little kids voice, I'm like, like what are they doing on? Whoa. And, just, and- like, there's no there's no moderation like that the, yes, you can if you can, if you pay the xbox live fee you're getting on you know and so that's the thing is that if you don't stop it uh, as a parent that game is more important than the message of mm. what 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 are you doing right now what what you if you stop it you are setting that boundary for that for your child and saying this is not this is not a right place to be you wouldn't you wouldn't let your walking through downtown Houston. Say we say we're in downtown Houston. We're walking right with those beautiful buildings. We're going to the theater, but we go past an alley and the alleyway looks dark. And say your child sees something shiny down there. Would you let them go get it? No. The answer is no, you wouldn't. You you would say, no, no, that's not where we're going right now. We're we're gonna go this way. But if your child took off, I guarantee you would take off after them and bring them back. <laughs> you know, as, as, so it's the same concept. If your child is listening, if you hear them, if you hear something going on and you're like, whoa, 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 no, no, no. You have every right to stop that situation because that game is not as important as your child's well-being. And, and I, I'm just saying as a, as a, as a parent, I, I'm talking as a parent. After that. <laughs> yeah. Well, but you're still the parent. <laughs> well, they, they and they get mad. They're going to throw yeah. a fit. Whatever. Yeah. I, I, but I, I would rather that happen Absolutely. and be have peace of mind knowing that I have set a boundary. Yeah. And that boundary is that you are more important to me than that game yeah. that you're playing. You are. And I'm going to risk making you mad right. and pull you off that game because I want you to be safe. I want you to be in a place that's appropriate. 
and hear appropriate things. And that's not appropriate. <laughs> and, and then have them tell you, was that appropriate? They're like, no, but they were making me mad. You know, they'd start crying and that's okay. They do. Yes, they that's, do. A, that's okay. At least you, you've set that precedent, you know, and, and um, it's, that's a, that's a hard one though, because when your kid is upset, it makes you, it makes you hurt too. You know, you're like, Oh, I don't, I didn't want to upset you. But anyway, I hope that's a, that's no, a- I hope I love, I, this is like the first time mom, I like, I just love, you know, Dewey's compassion and, and, and I think it's healing to other parents that may have felt like they've gone through these situations. Right. And like Nicole just blatantly just said it, like, you're going to be the bad person sometimes. Like yeah. you're going to be the, I hate you. You never let me do anything, you know, but you know, what is the risk? And I yeah, love yeah the you know metaphor that you just gave with the dark alley i love that because that's that dark side of technology you know that we need to be mindful of just because we can't physically see it in front of us you know and we're not in it you know in front of us in in touching it in a tangible way it's really getting our minds to understand that that still applies to the technology world. So, you know, thank you so much. You guys have been amazing. I'm pretty sure all of our parents are letting it sink in. Um, we are going to get you those resources um, with those search engines and, mm-hmm. you know, anything extra do we, that you can just provide to give us examples. Um, thank you, Nicole. Awesome mom. You go super mom. <laughs> yes. having me here i really enjoyed it i appreciate the opportunity yes so and, and we will see you guys thank you dewey once more um i hope that you enjoy parents all of this great information process it hit that you know rewind a couple of times if you missed it or something that you're stuck on this video will be available for you so you have it forever And if you have any other questions, please email me. And then also, um, if you are looking at our technology site, um, Dewey's information, I can provide that for you as well. Like if you have a question, um, maybe you didn't get to ask, um, I can send his email address as well. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in and we'll see y'all on the next Get Right with Ms. Right. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. It was nice to meet you. Bye-bye. Likewise. Thank you.